On today's kickoff episode of Fired Up, America's once unbreakable, unbeatable, most beloved company, Disney, continues to try to swim upstream to stay relevant, but the problem is they've lost their audience in the process of doing so. And I'm gonna break it all down on this kickoff episode of Fired Up. Unless you've been living under a rock, I mean, we all know that Hollywood's incredibly left-wing, incredibly liberal. Uh, We also know that Hollywood is completely bankrupt when it comes to the content department. I mean, they are straight up out of ideas. All they keep doing is going back and trying to recycle old ideas that worked, right? I mean, they go back to the same well over and over and over again. Um, You know, a few examples, you think of Fast and the Furious. I mean, what number are we actually on there? Like number 14? I mean, 15? Like, it's absolutely insane that we keep going back over and doing more Fast and the Furious movies. John Wick, what was that, five, six, seven? Um, Taken with Liam Neeson. I mean, that was a great movie back in the day. But it seems like every single movie Liam Neeson has made since that point in time, whether it was officially a a Taken sequel or not, is pretty much Taken, done all over again, and he just might be on a train or on a bus or in a car, but it's, it's, it's the same racket over and over and over again. So, you know, you, you've got all of these talentless writers in Hollywood that don't have any new fresh ideas, right? They've got nothing new, no new content. They keep going back to that same exact well, and unfortunately for them, it is dry. Now, Earlier this week, there's this uh, director and writer. His name is Kenya Barris, and he's actually the creator of a, a show called Blackish. So he was talking to Variety, and he, he mentioned that he's going to remake two classic movies. And he's going to remake both of these classic movies through a woke lens. So the two movies, It's a Wonderful Life, right? That old classic and The Wizard of Oz, which obviously is also a classic as well. Um, They are both going to be redone and told from a non-white perspective. So, I mean, obviously what that means is they are going to have all black characters, right? I mean, that's kind of where they're headed. Now, somebody probably should have told Kenya Barris that uh, there was a remake of The Wizard of Oz that kind of already fit that mold. It was called The Wiz came out in 1978, had an all-black cast. Uh, Diana Ross played Dorothy. Michael Jackson, you may have heard of him. He played the Scarecrow. So, already been done, but apparently this guy thinks this is fresh and new and exciting and he's gonna redo it again. Now, there's two major issues here. First things first, if you want your movie to be great, you have to come up with a new, fresh idea. Stop recycling old ideas. Like, Like, as consumers, as people who want to watch movies, whether it be streaming or, or at the movie theater, you know, and still have a, a day out with the kids or a day out with, with the spouse for, for date night, we want to consume fresh new content. We want it fresh, right? We want something new. So the writers, you have to use your creativity. And, and this is something we, you know, we're half joking about during the writer strike in Hollywood and during the actor strike in Hollywood, AI was fresh at that point in time. Everyone was talking about it and you know, the kind of the, the thought process is, well, maybe AI would actually help Hollywood. Maybe AI can help to come up with some new ideas. But until that day comes, we unfortunately have to deal with these writers who just want to recycle old content rather than using their creativity and coming up with new stuff. Second major issue, you have to know your audience. I mean, your audience is not asking for woke remakes. Nobody is asking for woke remakes. There's no demand for this stuff. There's no demand for woke remakes, you know? Uh, And I'm gonna go through and and, I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about Disney, right? I mean, if anyone has been hammered and beaten up by the woke bug, it is certainly Disney. And if you don't believe me on point number two, that, that nobody's asking for woke remakes, then you have not been paying close enough attention to what's been happening at Disney. 
Now, before we get into where Disney is today, I want to run through a brief history of how they became the, the great company that they were a few years ago, right? And now, and now I think over the course of the last few, they, they've definitely been beaten up a little bit, actually quite a bit. So you, if you go back to 1984, from 1984 through 2005, Michael Eisner, he was CEO. So he was running the company and he ran one heck of a company. I mean, he basically resuscitated a company that was just floundering and, and kind of dying a slow death since Walt Disney's death maybe 20 years or so earlier. And, and under Eisner's leadership, I mean, this company rolled out some classic blockbusters. Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Lion King, Pocahontas, Toy Story, Mulan, A Bug's Life, Tarzan, Monsters, Inc. I mean, there's just so many big hits that they came out with. Now, the, the thing that, that I think everyone needs to understand is Disney, they had a magic formula. They had a secret sauce. They were never a quantity shop as it related to content. They were a quality shop. They would release maybe one blockbuster every few years. And there was a lot of thought and creativity that went into each of these. They probably actually surveyed their audience to find out what their audience was thinking, right? But, but they rolled out these great movies because they never really had to focus on quantity. They didn't have to roll out 10, 12, 20 movies every single year. That wasn't their game. Their game was strictly high quality. Now, when Michael Eisner retired, then you got Bob Iger from 2005 through today. I mean, he did enter retirement very briefly where Bob Chapek uh, came in as the successor at CEO for about 10, 11 months before that dude got the can. Right, so then Iger came back and Iger is currently in the CEO seat today. Now, under Iger, they took a little bit of a different approach. And Iger actually led a flurry of acquisitions. I think that one of the first big ones was Pixar in 2006. Then he followed up with Marvel. In 2009, he bought Lucasfilm, which has Star Wars, Indiana Jones, bought them in 2012, and then they decided that they were gonna launch Disney Plus. They, they made the announcement, I believe, towards the end of 2018. Um, and the, the program actually rolled out at the end of 2019. So all great brands, all great acquisitions. I mean, it really gave them the ability to appeal to other audiences. You can appeal to, you know, the boys' boys who like Star Wars and Indiana Jones. You can appeal, it, it broadened their market in, in investments. One of the things we talk about is total addressable market. And through these acquisitions, that's what they did. You know, they obviously broadened things out. Now, one of the biggest issues with all that stuff I just said is that Disney Plus, their streaming service, if you look at the winners in streaming, Netflix being obviously the biggest winner, Netflix is not a quality shop. They are a quantity shop. They're always releasing new stuff. Some of the acting is terrible. Some of the stuff we're watching, there's voiceovers because it, it's, it's, you know, in, it, it's a European series or something like that. So Netflix rolls out a high quantity, but the quality is not A plus like Disney used to be back in the day. It might be B minus, but when you're constant, constantly rolling out a bunch of B minus stuff, it works for Netflix. So Netflix figured out their secret sauce, which is we're gonna roll out a lot of content. Some of it you may not like, but it's kind of the shotgun approach, right? Drink from a fire hydrant. Um, now, with regards to Disney, I, 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 I believe that by them having to enter the streaming world, it started to change their outlook. And look, they, they made the streaming announcement in 2018. When did they start thinking about it and strategizing about it? I don't know. They have never disclosed that. It could have been 2014, 2015. I don't know. But I would assume that they didn't just come up with the idea at the end of 2018 when they made that announcement. That had been something they had discussed and talked about for years and years and years before they finally made the decision that they were going to move forward with it. Now, all of the, these acquisitions were solid, but the issue Disney had 
is they began to infect all of their subsidiaries with woke ideology and they really started to focus more on quantity rather than quality because that's, that was the secret sauce that worked within the streaming world. So, you know, just to give you one example, I mean, you, you take a look at Star Wars. I mean, when I was a kid, like Star Wars, that, that's what the boys talked about. You know, we, we wanted to be Luke Skywalker, Han Solo. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, Darth Vader, Jabba the Hutt. There's all these cool characters. And, and the boys loved Star Wars in the 80s, in the 90s. Now, obviously, that's pre-Disney, uh, right? That was when Lucasfilm was a, was a standalone company. Uh, but the boys loved it. I, I don't remember any girls when I was eight years old or 12 years old or whatever it may have been who were big Star Wars fans. I just really don't, you know, and maybe it's selective memory. Maybe there were some that, that were big fans of Princess Leia. Um, but it was it was a, a series of movies that was, you know, it really catered to boys. Um, and there, it was no big deal. Like, that's OK. You, you can cater to boys. You can cater to girls. You don't have to be everything to everyone at all times. So, you know, Disney decided they wanted to make a follow up to the original three. And then we know, you know, there were the three prequels, which were just straight trash garbage put together by Lucasfilm. And then Lucasfilm sold to Disney and Disney rolled out, you know, episodes, what, uh, seven, eight, nine or something like that. Six, seven, eight. I forget what it was, but, um, you look at the very last movie they, they rolled out, which was uh, episode eight. So it was six, seven, eight. Um, they rolled out six, seven, and eight with a girl as the hero. No big deal. If you want to appeal to girls, that's fine. Um, you're going to lose some boys in the process who were big fans of Luke Skywalker, Han Solo. But that was their angle. They wanted to make the best of the best Jedis a girl. And if you go to and you look at the box office receipts from episode seven, where you had Luke Skywalker return. Now, he had a bit part. And Luke Skywalker, as we know, was played by Mark Hamill, who's a complete hack himself, if you follow him on social media. But that's a completely different story. Um, you look at episode seven and episode eight, which was The Last Jedi. That, that's the very last one that they've made to this point in that, that original franchise. Episode seven, I think grossed like just under a billion. And episode eight, The Last Jedi, grossed like 620 million. So it was like a 35% drop from episode seven to episode eight. Why do people show up for episode seven? I don't know. Maybe they want to see Luke Skywalker one last time, you know? They did not, however, show up for episode eight. So Disney struck out in the process of trying to be all things to everyone. You can't be all things to everyone. When you're all things to everyone, you're not really good at doing anything for any particular niche market that you might be pursuing. So we're gonna fast forward all the way to 2022 and 2023. Um, this is where things uh, really began to get ugly for Disney. Uh, if we remember, I believe it was in 2022, uh, the state of Florida under Ron DeSantis' leadership, um, they, they rolled out what was called the Parental Rights in Education Bill, a bill that the left wanted to call Don't Say Gay, but it was the Parental Rights in Education Bill. And what it would do is it would limit discussions of sexual orientation and gender identity in schools. In other words, you, you can't have those conversations with someone in first, second, third grade. Like it's just, that's not neither the place nor the time for, for that stuff to be brought up. Disney fired back. So Bob Chapek, you know, sitting in as, you know, that he was full-time CEO, little did he know it was going to be a very short term for him, fought back and he publicly made comments that, stating that Disney disagreed with that stance. And Disney actually issued a statement about the bill saying it should not have been passed and the goal was for the law to be either repealed or struck down. So DeSantis then in early 2023 decided he was going to get rid of Disney's special tax privileges following Disney's super left-wing stance on the parental rights and education bill. Now, because of that, you had a lot of parents on the right already begin to boycott, already begin to realize that, you know, maybe I don't want my kids like going to see these movies anymore. I really have never paid 
super close attention to the content? Maybe I should. So what you saw begin to happen is that the, the box office receipts on all their movies began to come down. Disney's stock price began to come down. And they essentially fell into that go woke, go broke category that, you know, we, we've heard people say that, you know, hundreds of times over the course of the last few years, and it tends to be true. Um, but, you know, what Disney ended up doing, in addition to taking a, a far left stance on that bill, is they started to, to weave woke ideology into their movies, and, and it resulted in a bunch of box office busts in 2023. Um, you know, you look at, at some of these movies, they were just complete trash, but I wanna, I wanna jump real quick to a clip from the All In podcast, um, where they went through and they talked about the biggest losers in 2023. Let's take a look. Who's your biggest loser in business in 2023? My biggest business loser is Disney. It seems mm, that every aspect of that's Disney's business <laughs> the bed in 2023. <laughs> I mean, all their major theatrical releases flopped amidst a conservative backlash against its woke social stances. You may recall that the actress who played Snow White in the remake accused Prince Charming of being a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a million examples. Even their, their Marvel franchise suddenly had bombs. They had to fire... Jonathan Majors, who was doing a fantastic job playing Kang in an entire franchise arc. They're going to have to reset now because of a criminal conviction involving him. Disney Plus subscriptions fell off a cliff. Even attendance at its theme parks declined dramatically because they charged way too much for families to visit. And then finally, Bob Iger picked a fight with Elon Musk over advertising. Remember, Elon publicly yep. told Iger to GFY. Good for you. And, yep. yep. And tens of thousands of Disney Plus subscribers canceled their subscriptions because of that. And it all makes you wonder if Iger now wishes he had stayed retired. I, too, picked Disney. I put Disney and <laughs> Warner Brothers. Uh, both of them had their comic book franchises collapse simultaneously on the, on the Warner Brothers side and the DC side. The Flash and Justice League, everything came apart. Streaming was too expensive. And you didn't mention these uh, horrific strikes that they had to deal with, and it feels like they had to give a ton of concessions. So Disney was my biggest loser as well with Warner Brothers as their little brother there. Chamath, we have a consensus there, rare consensus between Saks and I. Well, who did you have for your biggest loser in business? Well, you, you guys partially win. Okay. Because I'm going to have to agree with you guys, but I think the biggest loser in business was the Go Woke community who tried to synthetically and artificially use all these social movements as a way to drive revenue and just got totally burned. So Disney, Bud, Target. And I think the statement from consumers is, look, just sell a product, stay in your lane, make a better and better product for us at lower and lower prices. And otherwise, just let the politicians and the voters decide social issues. And I think that, that was pretty clear. All right, there you have it, folks. If you're going to make Bud Light, people just want to drink the damn beer. They're not interested in your politics. All right, so you heard it there. I mean, you had David Sachs, Jason Calacanis, both say Disney was the biggest loser. And then Shamath said, yeah, you know, anyone that was woke, right? Which includes Disney, Target, uh, Anheuser-Busch over the Bud Light, Dylan Mulvaney controversy. So, you know, when, when you look at Disney's slate of movies that they rolled out in 2023, it was a complete bust. And as you kind of go through and you think about what does it take for a, a box office movie to be a box office hit, for it to be a success, and kind of the rule of thumb in the industry is you need to get in gross box office receipts 2.5 times the production cost of the movie for it to be considered a success because obviously there's going to be costs beyond the production cost. You're gonna have distribution costs, you're gonna have marketing and advertising and all that stuff that comes with it. And obviously you have employees and you need to pull a profit and all those things. So 2.5X seems to be kind of that rule of thumb whereby these are going to be you know, considered successful movies. Now, I, I believe there were maybe eight um, big box office, ex 
big expected box office quote unquote hits rolled out in 2023. Of the, of the eight, six of them were complete busts. One, Elemental, was kind of a, maybe a break even. The only one that was successful was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Uh, cost like a little under 300 million, I believe. Um, let me see here. The cost, 250 million, and it grossed 845 million worldwide. So that it's pretty decent, right? But you look at, as we were talking at the beginning of this episode, we were talking about writers, directors, uh, running out of ideas and, and wanting to remake old content, but not just remaking old content, but remaking it through a woke lens. So the best example of that would be The Little Mermaid, which rolled out uh, in May of 2023. It was live action, not animation, live action. Um, and it took Disney's only redheaded princess, the only redheaded princess they have, which, I don't know, redheads might be a bigger minority uh, in this country than, than blacks, possibly. I don't know. I'm just pulling that one out of thin air, but they might be a bigger minority. Um, I shouldn't say bigger, more of a minority. And they took the only redheaded princess and they filled that spot with a black actor. Um, the audience wasn't crazy about it. And you can tell by the box office receipts. I mean, that, that thing cost them 300 million to produce. Then they got a little credit from the UK of, I don't know, 40, 50 million, which kind of brought the net cost down to, to 250 million. It grossed only 564 million. So not even two times um, what, what, not even two times when 2.5 times is what's considered a success. So, you know, when you look at all these, all these flops, you have to ask yourself, why, why is Disney struggling? Like what, what is their biggest issue? And I think we really all know the answer, right? When you look at Disney, I mean, this is a, this is like one of the biggest, best brands that this country has ever experienced. I mean, there's little kids out there that ask Santa Claus for a trip to Disney World every single year. Um, I don't know if they still do this when you win the Super Bowl, but I remember growing up, Joe Montana was going to Disney World after he won, you know? Like, the, it was the big thing back in the day. And, you know, this brand has just been tarnished, you know? And, and it's been tarnished very similarly to the way that, um, Target ruined their brand with the Tucket bathing suits. That was not well received and led to a boycott. Anheuser-Busch, uh, there's been the Bud Light issues, obviously, with Dylan Mulvaney, the boycotts there. Um, you know, you take a Anheuser-Busch, I mean, that's going to be a Harvard business case at some point, a Harvard business school case study at some point in the future. Um, where they start to analyze what went wrong. You have a, a company in Anheuser-Busch that ran the most incredible, unbelievable Super Bowl commercials for like 30 or 40 years, and they undid it all in one social media video with Dylan Mulvaney. Like that, it, it absolutely blows my mind. And how did they get to where they got to? I mean, this is a completely different topic, but they got to where they were prior to the Dylan Mulvaney thing by being a bros beer. And if you don't believe me, just go back and watch some of those Super Bowl commercials from the 80s and 90s, and probably early 2000s as well. So, Disney stock has been hammered. I mean, it currently has about a like $174 billion valuation. It's down over 52% from its peak in March of 2021, where it was $366 billion. How to go from 366 billion down to 174 billion, go woke, go broke. So look, I'm gonna wrap up here by talking about where, where Disney needs to go from here. Like what they need to do is they need to get back to blocking and tackling, get back to the basics. You don't have to be everything for everybody. When you are accountable to everybody, you're accountable to no one because you're getting pulled in too many different directions. You gotta get back to blocking and tackling. It's okay to make movies that only boys like. It's okay to make movies that only girls like. That's okay. Not everything has to be gender neutral. And just like Shamat said in that video, stay in your lane. 
It's not your place to play politics. You are creating movies. I don't even know what the average age of a Disney movie viewer might be. Seven? Eight? I don't know. I don't know what the average age of a viewer is. But for you to be weaving politics and, and, and sexual gender orientations and, and all these things into movies where your average viewer is just a little kid, it's not your place. That's The parents don't want their kids watching things that are going to essentially create toxicity in their brain or potentially jade them. So stay in your lane, stay in your lane, make great movies, try and you know, get back to the quality over quantity thing that, that really was the magic sauce in the past. And you know, there's nothing wrong with boys being boys, girls being girls. You know, I, my kids are 16, 14, and 12. My, my daughters are 16 and 14, my son's 12. When they were growing up, my girls played with dolls and doll houses. My son played video games, dressed up as a superhero. I mean, it's okay. It's okay for boys to be boys and girls to be girls. We don't have to have a crossover. We don't need gender neutral so we can cater to non-binary or, or people who are confused. It's okay. It's okay for boys to be boys and girls to be girls. Get back to the blocking and tackling because Disney, got to tell you, 98% of the population, 99%, I don't know what it is, but it is a, a, a lot of the population. They're okay with boys being boys and girls being girls. You have to stop catering to these tiny little groups while jeopardizing your key audience and isolating and ostracizing the people that want to come and see your content, the people that keep the lights on at, at, at your headquarters, that keep the lights on at Disney World, Disneyland. You, you need to know your key audience and stay true to your key audience. Now, just to wrap up here, I appreciate you all spending some time watching this kickoff video, first ever video for, for Fired Up. Um, I would love to know your thoughts. I would love to get some feedback uh, on maybe some topics you'd love to hear me talk about, maybe on, on how, how this thing went today, what you'd like to see differently, what you liked, what you didn't like. Please let me know. You can shoot me a direct email. The email is firedup, F-I-R-E-D-U-P, firedup at swpconnect.com. Thanks for watching. See you soon.